Justice is more important than peace, as the soul is more important than the body. Welcome again to Issues and Ideas, the program where each week we present both sides of today's most important controversies. Today we'll be discussing the issue of social justice. I'm looking forward to it because I'm not even sure what social justice means. Our guests tonight are Senator Dave Davis, who is chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Social Justice, and Ms. Claudia Clue, who is executive director of the American Citizens for Social Justice. Thank you both for joining us. Well, thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thanks, it's great being here. Well, I guess the first question would be, what exactly is social justice? Well, I'm certain that although Ms. Clue and I do not agree on very many things, we would at least agree on that. <laughs> I'm not so sure, Senator. Well, now, social justice has to do with protecting the rights of all of our citizens. Social justice is not about protecting rights. It's about providing now rights. Now, let Recon me finish, please. How about you let me start? But now, as I was saying... You just wanted to control the discussion, control no, all the discourse, no, cut off the debate. No one has done more to protect free speech than Protect I free speech. You won't even let me talk. But as I was saying, I have introduced legislation concerning social justice My issues. organization has fought for policies that Congress hasn't even begun to look at, such as... As chairman right of the Social Justice Committee, I have held many hearings on social... I have never once been invited to testify at any hearing, even though I'm widely recognized as an advocate for social justice. A great many of our citizens from across this land have attended these hearings, and the consensus is unanimous. Our studies show that the American people have no confidence in legislative solutions solutions to these problems. First of all, the rights of women and children are not being recognized. This is not just about protecting women and children. This is about protecting all persons, including corporations. Oh, if you want to talk about corporations, let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about protection in the workplace. Okay, I'm uh, talking about protecting the American dream. I'm talking about equal rights. Building stronger communities. Whole segments of the population are being ignored, shut out. Respecting the rule of law. I'm talking basic rights. We need to get away from partisan politics for just one moment. There are moral uh, issues affecting everyone. The American people deserve better than this. Clue, the, the I guess what, what do we get for our tax our money? What about accountability? Oh, is it really, uh, is it why isn't health care a matter of social justice? Then why isn't uh, the government uh, done anything to lower the cost? What about safe neighborhoods and decent housing? And what about education? Excuse me. Excuse me. What exactly is social justice? If people are unsure about what social justice is, and they are unsure, they seem to be even more confused about what Catholic social teaching is. It's a subject that quickly gets politicized, and unfortunately, both ends of the political spectrum tend to misunderstand it and misrepresent it. Some people think Catholic social teaching simply means finding ways to excuse inexcusable behavior. But Catholic social teaching has absolutely nothing to do with homosexual rights or abortion rights or contraception rights because none of those things are rights. They are wrongs. And the church clearly teaches that these things are wrong and it will not compromise its teachings on any of those matters. Catholic social teaching really does not have a lot of nuance to it. It basically boils down to one thing, justice, justice for the poor. The church has always emphasized the corporal works of mercy, uh, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, tending to the sick, and so on. But as important as those things are, this is not what Catholic social teaching is about. It's not about mercy, it's about justice. There's a distinction between justice and mercy, which is perhaps best summed up in a line from G.K. Chesterton. 
children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. With mercy, the emphasis is about not giving the guilty what they deserve. With justice, the emphasis is about giving the innocent what they do deserve. When we recite the Magnificat, that beautiful prayer of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we are describing a vision of social justice. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, he hath exalted the humble. As Chesterton points out, every social revolution in history has failed solely because it could only fulfill half of that revolutionary maxim of the Magnificat. There have indeed been times when the mighty have been deposed from their seats, but no revolution has ever yet achieved the sequel, lifting up the humble. The Catholic Church has worked to achieve this without something so drastic as a revolution, but with the teaching and the applying of the gospel and transforming lives, the Church wants to create a just society, and one of the basic elements is that those who work are entitled to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And interestingly enough, the Church has recognized this has been a problem, especially in modern society, where a large segment of the population is not fairly benefiting from their own work. The first encyclical on Catholic social teaching was issued in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, just before the dawn of the 20th century, by Pope Leo XIII. In Rerum Novarum, he argued that in a just society, as many as possible should become owners. Ownership is an ideal. Thou shalt not steal would not be one of the commandments if ownership were not an ideal. Just as thou shalt not commit adultery would not be a commandment if marriage were not an ideal. Thou shalt not kill would not be a commandment if life were not an ideal. Thou shalt not bear false witness would not be a commandment if truth were not an ideal. So property is an ideal. Ownership is an ideal. Pope Leo XIII recognized that this ideal was not being acknowledged in the modern world. The reason why ownership is important is that it provides independence and protects that basic unit of society, the family. This important principle has been reaffirmed by all the social encyclicals issued by all the popes since Pope Leo XIII, including the recent encyclical Caritas in Veritate of Pope Benedict XVI. G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc and others took Pope Leo XIII's teaching and developed a social and economic idea known as distributism. It differs from both socialism and capitalism. And the best way of explaining it is that socialism is based on communal rights and capitalism is based on individual rights. But distributism is based on family rights and on the idea that a society and an economy should protect and nurture and serve that primary institution of a father, a mother, and children. The social encyclicals are consistent with another famous encyclical, Humanae Vitae. Pope Paul VI saw all the dangers of contraception. It is the contraceptive mentality that is responsible for the myopic nature of modern economics. More wealth actually brings more misery, as desires that are fruitless and self-serving can never be fulfilled. An economy based on the philosophy of taking as much as possible cannot work because there's never any satisfaction, because there's never enough. The contraceptive mentality also lends to the idea of lending, the idea of building endless debt and never paying, paying back anything. Take the pleasure and, and run. But a consumer-driven society that keeps buying and never paying is headed for collapse. This follows the same mode of insanity described by Chesterton when he talks about a modern world that exalts lust but forbids fertility. It cannot be sustained. And yet, anyone who talks about restraint 
is vilified, whether it is restraint about free trade or free love. But the truth is that neither trade nor love are free. Both require responsibility and discipline. Both require limits. It's this idea of limits that the modern world finds so repugnant. Freedom is mistaken to mean throwing off restraint. But true freedom exists within the rules. Freedom, which is self-government, means self-control. Doctrine and discipline, says Chesterton, may be walls, but they are the walls of a playground. It's interesting how we eagerly await certain encyclicals, but the fact is there has never been a real surprise in any of them. The Pope simply affirms the truths that the Church has always affirmed. It's always been about the continuity of truth. The encyclicals are needed only because the world changes and needs to hear the old truths stated once again. The great surprise of Humanae Vitae was that the church was not going to give in to the world. Lust is still wrong. The great surprise of Caritas in Veritate was that the church was not going to give in to the world. Greed is still wrong. In both encyclicals, the family is defended. We cannot have sexual arrangements that destroy the family. We cannot have economic arrangements that destroy the family. Distributism defends the ideal of ownership, keeping the connection between home and work rather than separating the two as the modern world has separated everything from everything else. We've seen the separation of work from home, the separation of business from morality, the separation of morality from religion, the separation of sex from birth, and the separation of husband from wife. Catholic social teaching tries to put a broken world back together. But the problem with the church's social teaching is that it deals with a subject that makes people very, very touchy. It is a subject that is more personal even than sex. The subject is money. How we get money, how we spend it, how we keep it or don't keep it. Mammon, of course, is the one alternative to the true God. But even apart from the danger of worshiping money as a false god is the danger of making the economy a false king. Chesterton knows how sensitive a topic this is. Let me touch on that terribly delicate matter, the relation between truth and trade. Medieval man went in for a mystical idea called the just price. He wanted to know what a thing was really worth, and if possible to avoid paying too little or too much for it. Then there appeared another test of trade, equally logical and within limits, equally definite. It rested on the needs and motives of a highly simplified person who was called the economic man. This gentleman, who was certainly not a gentleman, was by hypothesis entirely selfish, but moderately sensible and above all moderately firm. He knew what he wanted and could not be persuaded that he wanted anything else. But the modern psychology of salesmanship was entirely concerned with persuading him that he wanted something else. Business was not only no longer based on the just price, it was no longer based on the second theory of supply and demand. It was based on the idea that the supply was entitled to demand a demand. In some sense, the supply would supply its own demand. The demander was reduced to a condition in which he did not know what the devil he did demand. The trader was to study, not the facts about necessity and utility and what the people want, but rather the fancies, the moods, the mechanical tricks, the mere absent-mindedness, all the weaker side of man. What Chesterton is saying here is that the old economic models don't work anymore. 
This same point is made by Benedict XVI in Caritas in Veritate. Chesterton predicted that in the later 20th century, most of our time would be taken up by arguing with communists, and he warned about arguing the wrong way. As I think about it, there are two recognized ways of arguing with a communist, and they're both wrong. There is also a third way, which is right, but which is never recognized. Curiously enough, the two communist ways of contradicting communism also happen to contradict each other. The first conventional method is simple enough. The capitalist says to the communist, you shall not enter my house, for I know you would burn it down. You shall not speak to my family, for I know you would blow them up. You are a common thief and murderer, and I am a highly respectable and moral person, and not as, as this Russian communist. Now that is talking like a Pharisee, and the Pharisee is a more ancient enemy of the Christian than the Marxist. But I rather prefer it to the other method, which I find extremely common among those who profess to defend property or individualism against the Marxist heresy. It is this second case. The capitalist says to the communist, you believe in a lot of nonsense about the brotherhood of men, but I tell you as a practical man that every man wants to get as much as he can for himself and will beat down his own brother if he needs to, in business, if he can. Every man must obey his acquisitive instinct. I read these very words recently in attack on the Marxist theory. People use these arguments against communism as if they were the only arguments against communism. And then they are surprised that a number of spirited young people become communists. You see, they do not seem to see that to such young people, the capitalist in question only seems to be saying, I'm a greedy old scoundrel, and I forbid you to be anything else. Now, the true, full, and final argument against communism is that private property is much more important than private enterprise. A pickpocket represents private enterprise, but we should hardly say that he supports private property. Private property is not a bribe that exists for the sake of private enterprise. On the contrary, private enterprise is only a tool or weapon that may sometimes be useful to preserve private property. And it is necessary to preserve private property, simply because the other name for it is liberty. On the one hand, it is not merely a conventional respectability. On the contrary, it is only the man with some property and privacy who can live his own life freely. On the other hand, it is not a mere license to trade, still less a mere license to cheat. On the contrary, the whole point of property is that in that alone can be naturally nourished the sentiment of honor. In Caritas in Veritate, Pope Benedict makes it clear that every economic decision has moral consequences and that we have to act with principles other than pure profit. If capitalism is mere acquisition and accumulation, it will always provoke communism. Big business and big government are dueling giants that are chained to each other. The church defends the freedom to trade, to buy, and to sell, but rights presuppose responsibilities. Every freedom is a potential abuse of freedom. The role of the state is to protect against the abuses. Chesterton says government is only an accidental and even abnormal necessity arising from the imperfection of life. The state cannot become a universal provider or else, says Chesterton, it's just another big shop. Taking care of the poor means more than giving them handouts. It means creating a society that restores their dignity. The key to human dignity is liberty. 
There are many reasons for Chesterton's importance, but perhaps the most overlooked is that he is a defender of liberty. It's a word that we all like the sound of, but we seldom think about what it really means. We apparently haven't been thinking much about it in modern times as we've watched it erode. Every time we trade freedom for security, we soon watch it become slavery. We have to start doing more things for ourselves. Liberty means doing things and not having them done for us. It is a freedom that we want everyone to enjoy. Chesterton says, liberty is life and heaven is symbolized by wings, and hell is symbolized by chains. I'm Dale Alquist, and thanks for joining us on the Apostle of Common Sense. And please, support the American Chesterton Society and help us make common sense more common. <laughs>